the upper dance, but that was the piece. She's the piece. Mm -hmm. That was good. It was 2002, and I was driving down Interstate 40, feeling a little bit blah. You ever felt blah before? Mm -hmm. A little bit blah. I spent the last 10 years of my life working with the <coughs> chancellor at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington as the executive producer of these environmental documentaries that filmed on public television. We filmed all along the eastern seaboard, all the way from Maryland to Florida. And my job as the executive producer was to raise money. So I was a professional better. That's what I did. I put the proposals together. I, I did all the research. I went out and I made the big ask trying to bring in those funds. My friends thought I had a really cool job. And, and I did. I felt very blessed. You know, I was doing good work. However, something was missing. And driving down the road that day, I knew that I didn't feel that zeal and that zest and that passion for life that I used to feel on a regular basis. So I asked myself, when did I really last feel that type of ecstasy, that type of just being on fire with life? And I had two memories. And the first memory was growing up singing in my parents' band. My father was 14 and my mother was 12. When they met, they were performing in the Rest Carlton Big Band. My mother was a singer, my father was a saxophone player. They became immediate friends. They then became best friends, then they started dating, then they got married at 18 and 20, and they always had a band. And then look what happened. And then look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> they had four daughters. They initiated us into their band at around the age of 10. They would go and buy us an evening gown, and they would teach us songs like, Every time it rains, it rains, pennies from heaven. We were the anniversary Partridge family. We would go to anniversaries and weddings, we would travel in Partridge family. They had normal jobs too, but it was just a really cool way to grow up. My parents taught us about family and connection and togetherness and music and love. My older sister, Vaughn, and I would sit around with our acoustic guitars at age 12 writing songs thinking we were going to change the world. But driving down the road that day, I couldn't remember the last time I had written a song. I also had a second memory that day. My second memory was in 1988, and I was the assistant volleyball coach for the University of North Carolina Wilmington Seahawks. It was my first job out of graduate school, and I thought this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I was standing on a four-foot table in my memory, because this was a true story, on one side of the volleyball net with a ball in my hand. And my team was on the 10-foot line. It's the closest line to the net on the other side of the net. I would say, go hit the ball and say go. I was very aggressive back then. And they would have to go one at a time, running across the court. I would throw it right out of their reach. They would have to pass it up to me. Then they would have to backpedal to the back of the court. I would throw it over their heads. They would have to pass it up. Then they would have to charge towards me, and I would hit it as hard as I could at their heads. It was my favorite drill in the whole world. I loved that time in my life. I was in love with life. The entire time they were going, I was encouraging them to run faster, to try harder, to dive farther. You see, I had known from an early age that I was going to coach college sports, so I crafted out my life and made that dream happen. I love working with these young women, helping them, inspiring them, encouraging them to dream more, to be more, to come together as a group and work together towards a common vision. I was truly in love with life. Love. Love, that feeling of love, this esoteric thing that we talk about in unity so much, but how do you capture it and how do you get those moments back? Let's look and see what some of the great masters say about love. The spiritual law of divine love says this. This is from the Course in Miracles. We must recognize and accept the fact that love is our true nature. Our creator, the ultimate source of divine love, instilled love within our soul memory so that every living thing is connected to each other and to God. Hmm. Okay. So that, that is what it says. But I don't, I, don't always, I don't always know what new thought information says, right? I don't always know what new thought. I had studied this back then, and I don't think I knew what it meant. So I was going down the road that day in 2002, thinking about how I was feeling kind of blocked, right? I had those two big memories. Thinking about the spiritual <coughs> law of divine love. <coughs> Thinking about what I've learned in unity. I was also a unity student at the time, 1988. I go back to my 
memory in 1988. I'd been in Unity for several years. 2002, I started in 1986. Been in it for many years. But I was still not feeling like this. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted those two memories back. I didn't know what to do. Driving down the road, I wanted to feel that way. I didn't know what to do. And so I started doing what we learn in Unity. I started practicing these tools of meditation. I started practicing the tools of affirmative prayer. Asking, you know, for the answers, knowing the universe would provide the answers of how to get that zest and zeal back, even though I had this cool job at UNC Wilmington, knowing I would get the answer. And two weeks later, the answer came. I've always heard voices. Any other voice hearers besides Brenda Penny? All right, let me see your hands. Yeah, I've got more of you among me. Two weeks later, after driving in the car down Interstate 40, two weeks later, after having those memories and studying the Course in Miracles, studying unity principles of affirmations, of meditation, the answer came to me. And it came in the form of a voice, and the voice said, Hey, you should be a motivational speaker, and you should be an executive coach. You can use music to inspire people, and you can teach unity principles while you're coaching them. I'm like, who is talking to me? Because that's just not going to happen. I like my life. I like my house. I don't have the money to make a change. But you know what? When something is yours to do, and you get a message that it's yours to do, it's like an inner calling. And the inner calling is just going to keep on talking to you until you respond. Whenever, but whenever there's something big like that, there's a lot of resistance, right? So the resistance started coming. I started saying things like, no, I can't do that. I like my life. I don't love it, but I like it. I started saying things like, I don't have the money to take that kind of risk. I started saying things like, no, I'm too tired. I, don't want to, I just don't want to start again. But the call kept coming. When you have an inner calling and it's yours to do, it's going to come louder and it's going to come bigger. I started seeing articles on my desk. It would just appear about executive coaching. I would throw them aside. The call kept coming. I started seeing great speakers on television. I would turn the channel. The call kept coming. So when people would say to me, can you coach me? I know you were a fundraiser. I'm like, I cannot coach you. I am not a certified coach. They'd say, coach me. I'm like, I can't afford to coach. I finally said, okay, if a big company comes along and pays for it, because it costs $3,000 that I wasn't willing to spend and didn't have, if a big company comes along and pays for it, then just maybe I'll consider it. And then one day I was on an airplane flying to a gig, right in that spot, taken off from the runway where I like to go to sleep. And I heard the person beside me say, hi, my name is Lisa. Not that Lisa. No, Lisa. Hi, my name is Lisa. And I'm like... Oh no, oh no, she didn't say, hi, my name is Lisa. I want to go to sleep and I want to drool waking up on someone's shoulder. <laughs> but I heard the voice say, talk to her. So I turned and I said, hi, my name is Elaine. And you guys, when I looked in this person's eyes, I knew she was a kindred spirit. I knew she was a soulmate of sorts. I knew there was something that we were supposed to gain from each other. And so we started talking. We talked for three straight hours. She went to Unity Church in Utah. I didn't know there were Unity Churches in Utah. We talked about health. We talked about love. We talked about work and music. We talked about everything. Mm -hmm. Two hours into the flight, she said, you've got to meet my boyfriend. He owns this big executive coaching company. He's looking for people like you to be coaches. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm not a coach. She just said, no, look for people like you to be coaches. People with your background and beliefs and passion and spiritual essence, looking for people like you, please call him. And so I said, okay, universe, because I'm telling you what, the universe will open doors for you, and if you don't walk through them, it will kick you through them. <laughs> so I said, okay, universe, I'm listening. And so I called her boyfriend. He put me in touch with the vice president of coaching, who said, oh, we really want you, we love you, but you know what, you're a contractor, not a staff member, so you still gotta pay the $3,000 and get certified. I said, I just don't have $3,000 right now to spend on coaching. So he got very quiet. Big pause. He said, you know what? This feels right to me. So we're going to waive the fee for you. <laughs> <laughs> so a big company came along and paid for the executive coaching. And I have to tell you, that was one of the most transformational experiences of my life. Everything that we learn, that the answers are there, we just open our eyes and open our hearts, came true. It was a transformational experience for me because that was the start of my coaching career. And today I coach people all over the country. And even if it's a business concept they're wanting coaching on, it never ends up that way. It's always spiritual. 
coaching them on unity principles, coaching them on love, coaching them on being on purpose. And when I'm coaching them, I feel like I'm on purpose. I feel like I'm using my gifts, that God is moving through me, co-creating with me. I'm feeling <coughs> in love with life all over again. And as far as speaking, an agency, Campus Speak picked me up in 2003. I've been speaking to college agencies ever since. Has the road been totally problem-free? No. But it has been perfect because I have felt in love with life. And so we go back to this when we talk about love. And we talk about all of you and your gifts. And, and I look at it again. I look at it today because we, we want to talk to you about love and still don't always understand how to grasp that feeling. I want to read it again. Spiritual law of divine love. We recognize and accept the fact that love is our true nature. Our creator, the ultimate source of divine love, and still love within our soul members. So every living thing is connected to each other and to God. Okay, cool, that's great. I still don't always understand it. I believe I'm a new thought student. But there's other things to supplement us when we don't understand something. I like to go back to sacred texts. Let's see what our way shower Jesus has to say about love. Ah, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. No commandment greater than these. That's interesting. I think what Jesus was saying is we've got to do that to feel that which we already are. Loving God, loving neighbor, loving self. Loving self. That kind of got mixed up there over the years. Loving self. And you know what? Sometimes loving ourselves is the hardest thing to do. But it is equally as important to everything else. There's a lot of ways we can love ourselves. We can be compassionate. We can be gentle. Can be kind, you could forgive yourself. And another important way to love yourself is to use your gifts. Because you guys, you're all born with divine gifts. We are born with divine gifts. We are. And it's our job to figure out what those are and build our lives around them. Sometimes our life gets off track, like mine did when I was driving down the road. Our job is to remember those gifts and make sure we are honoring them. And maybe your gift is motivating and inspiring people. If it is, do it. You don't have to change your job, your career like I did. Do it. Do it, do it every day. Inspire someone. Maybe your gift is writing or poetry. You don't have to change your career. Write a blog. Write a poem. Maybe it's music or banjo. Get up and sing all the time. Maybe your gift is just next great new business idea, new marketing idea. Maybe it's service. You can do your service work right here at this church. But whatever it is, I can promise you it is yours to do, because you were born with that. Those are your gifts. Those are loving yourself. And that's what this next song is about. It's about using your gifts, being on purpose, and when you do, you make the world a better place and you bring more love in. It's your life. 
self means willingness to walk away from a situation. I'm not really good at that. Walk away from a situation if you're not able to use your gifts. Melania. Well, yeah. Can I tell can I plug something in here? Do anything you want. We didn't rehearse it. Is that okay? I love it when you plug things in. Melania's <laughs> idea is awesome. Um well she was talking about gifts. And when she came to me and said she wanted to do a CD, I had a little hole in my in my song where I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go down and we'll, I'll do it with you. So this is the first song that, that she took down to the studio without me. Oh, the other one? It's Your Life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it comes out a ballad. I'm like, Elaine, it, it wasn't a ballad. And so we were back and forth arguing, well, it's great this way, right? But I was really quiet then, those of you who know me. I'm still quiet, but I was really quiet back then. Right? So right. this is where you take over and you talk about gifts. Yeah. Nancy's got great gifts, a musical arrangement. No, that's not what I meant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant is that you never... <laughs> yes, talk about me. Um, what I meant was that you never know what somebody can do. Oh, she, yeah, I had no clue. One thing, one new skill after another emerged. She just started out laying on the couch at the studio. And then after a while, she would just stand up and say, all right, no, we're going to do it like this. No, I never so, did that. I said, could you try this? <laughs> She's a brilliant composer, and now we know. But the first song, I went down there without her. And if you got, you have the CD. It's, it's your life. And you see how we really play it? This is how she wrote the melody. It's your life. That's how it was supposed to be. And that's the point she's making. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. <laughs> the point is never underestimate. Never underestimate. No, she's, she's a master. She really is. So getting back to the show, sometimes you um, can't leave a situation. And you, and you need to. Because the universe is opening another door for you. And uh, that's what this song's about. And I like it when you tell the story. Well, this is about being in a place maybe where you're so frustrated. Um, it's really because you're not vibrating maybe like other people around you are. And that's an easier way to look at situations. And when you're unhappy and you feel like you have a low resonance, it's just a vibration. Um, and you need to find out who you really are and get back on the saddle again. And these are some beautiful lyrics Elaine wrote to a song called Who I Really Am. Melody, Did I say everything? Yeah. I'm standing in the tide. The waves are crashing in. Now I must decide. Do I sink or swim? Looking for a raft to carry me to shore. And now I need an eagle to teach me how to soar. Then stepped on, bent down, been treated so bad.
That always gets the loudest applause at other churches, too. <laughs> the second part of Jesus' commandment to us was to love each other. Give love away. Put love in action. Prayers are good. Thoughts are good. They are real. So are tangible items. I think Jesus was talking about making it tangible. And two of the greatest role models that I have in my life for making love tangible and giving love away and putting it in action are my parents. So I'm going to tell a story about mom now. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. It was 1990, and I was sitting in the high school of my old, I was sitting in the auditorium of my old high school waiting for the show to begin. The lights flickered on and off, letting the audience know there was five minutes left to the production of music, music, music. We sat there in great anticipation. Until finally, the lights went down, the curtains opened, and up there on the stage were 30 adults with Down syndrome getting ready to lip sync their production to Delta Dawn. We were so excited. This was the fundraiser my mother had produced for many, many years. It was for a group of people called the DDA, Developmentally Disabled Adults of Rockingham County. Throughout the city, people would audition and be in the show, but the opening number was always the DDA, and they always took the house down. My mother was the director of Parks and Recreation, a small town where I grew up called Madison, North Carolina, but she made that recreation program like it was New York City. She'd gone back to college when she was 40 years old to major in therapeutic recreation, and she vowed when she got out of school, even if she had a job in Parks and Recreation, she would always have a special place in her heart for anyone with any kind of disability. And so she did. She worked with the DDA from 1986 to 2011 when she retired. She watched them grow old. And she did a program a month for them. Sometimes it was a dance or a prom or a Halloween party <coughs> or an Elvis party. They loved Elvis parties. <laughs> Their favorite event, though, was music, music, music.